Now that we have established the main components of this CNS, we can start exploring each structure in greater detail, starting with this panel cord. So, if you recall our discussion on the functional and structural model of the central nervous system, you will remember that the spinal cord represents an important hub in receiving sensory afferent information such as touch, pain, temperature, and proprioception. The spinal cord is also an important hub for sending motor efferent information to the body via the peripheral nervous system. Recall that the peripheral nervous system mostly communicated with the spinal cord through what are called spinal nerves. Additionally, the spinal cord plays an integral role in mediating many sensory motor reflexes that are crucial to our survival. For that reason, to understand how the spinal cord operates and what each of its components does, it is crucial to understand how the sensory and motor information is transmitted across that structure. But, given that the objective of this video is to cover the anatomy of the spinal cord, I will not dive deep into what happens at the periphery, but rather keep it at an intuitive level so we can focus on the anatomy here. The details regarding what happens in the peripheral nervous system with respect to touch, pain, muscle contraction and so on will be covered in other videos that will focus on these topics. With this being said, let's start from the classic lateral view we are used to see. The first essential element that should be mentioned is that obviously, the spinal cord and the brain are not unprotected like this in our bodies. As you might know, the brain is protected by the skull and the spinal cord is protected by a complex of bones, muscle and tendons called the vertebral column. If we take a closer look at a segment of the vertebral column, you will first notice the bones that surround the spinal cord. These bones are called vertebrae, and for our purposes, given that we want to focus on the spinal cord, the main purpose of these bones is to protect the spinal cord. As a reminder, the spinal cord that we see in the middle has generally three important functions. Namely, through mechanisms we will cover later, the spinal cord constitutes an intermediate for sensory and motor functions such as touch, pain, temperature, proprioception and muscle activation, as well as homeostatic functions in the case of the autonomic nervous system. Moreover, the spinal cord contains sensory motor reflexes that allow us to swiftly interact with our environment. The spinal cord also contains what are called central pattern generators, which are circuits that produce rhythmic movements such as walking. To communicate with the rest of the body, the spinal cord is connected with the peripheral nervous system via the spinal nerves that bring sensory afferent information and send efferent motor commands. As you can notice, the vertebrae are made in such a way to have holes so the spinal nerves can enter and leave the spinal cord. You will also notice from this figure that the spinal cord is highly bilateral. This means that when we divide our bodies in half, the two halves of the spinal cord mirror each other and that also goes for the spinal nerves that go in and out of it. For that reason, the spinal nerves are usually talked about in pairs, and it turns out that we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. To see it more clearly, let's go back to our lateral view. If we consider simply our central nervous system, and a partial view of the vertebral column, you will see that when we include the spinal nerves leaving the spinal cord, we have 31 pairs, so 62 spinal nerves in total. These 31 pairs of spinal nerves whether they leave or come from a certain region of the body, supply the sensory motor information for a specific area of the body. Generally speaking, if we consider a front and back view of what the 31 pairs supply, they cover the vast majority of our bodies, with the exception of the front of our faces that is covered by a particular cranial nerve that we will cover later. Now, within this large area covered by the spinal nerves, it is possible to further divide that area based on the region that each spinal nerve pair covers. This given region that a pair of spinal nerve covers, or innervates, is called a dermatome. Consequently, we can say that we have 31 different dermatomes. An important aspect about the anatomy of the vertebral column that I have yet to mention is the fact that the spinal cord is divided into five distinct regions called cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal. The names of these regions are based on the location of the vertebra near the spinal nerve. The cervical section, which, by the way, comes from the Latin word cervix, that means neck, represents the neck region. In this cervical region, it contains 8 of the 31 spinal nerve pairs. The shorthand terminology to classify these spinal nerves is to generally call them C1 to C8 to refer to the spinal nerve pair. In terms of the dermatome region, you will notice that the 8 pairs of the cervical region altogether cover the neck region and a good portion of the arms.
The following section, thoracic, represents the chest region and it has 12 of the 31 spinal nerve pairs. In a similar fashion to the labeling of the cervical region, these 12 pairs of nerves are referred from T1 to T12. As you can see from the dermatom regions, the thoracic sections generally cover the upper back, the majority of the torso, and a portion of the arms. Next, the lumbar section of the vertebral column covers the lower back and has 5 of the 31 spinal nerve pairs. The dermatome regions, which are labeled L1 to L5, cover mostly the legs and the lower back. Then, the sacral region has 5 of the 31 pairs and covers mostly the legs. The dermatomes and spinal nerve pairs are labeled from S1 to S5. Finally, the coccygeal region is associated with one single pair and covers the region of the coccyx. Two important aspects to consider with dermatomes is that first, the regions that they cover overlap greatly and for that reason, if you have some damage to a particular spinal nerve pair, you won't completely lose sense of touch or movement in that theoretical region. Secondly, the dermatome regions vary greatly among individuals, so it is important to keep that in mind when consulting that graphic. With these regions now covered, there is an important anatomical element that we can now appreciate. Indeed, when we consider a view of the back of the spinal cord, or simply a dorsal view, you will notice that it is enlarged in the upper and lower regions of the spinal cord. These two enlargements are respectively called the cervical enlargement and the lumbosacral enlargement. The two are caused by the fact that our arms and legs supply and demand more processing from the nervous system, which causes our spinal cord to be enlarged. If we consider backward divisions, you will see that the cervical enlargement occurs between C3 and T1, and the lumbosacral enlargement occurs between L1 and S2. Now, another anatomical element that you might have noticed in these drawings is that the spinal cord is actually shorter than the vertebral column. Indeed, the spinal cord, which, starting from the caudal end of the brainstem, only reaches the first few vertebrae of the lumbar divisions. This terminal end is called the conus medullaris. As a result, the spinal nerves that come from the legs produce what is known as the cauda equina, which is basically the collection of spinal nerves that innervate the lower body and leave from the end of the spinal cord. The final anatomical detail that I believe is relevant to mention is that when we consider the skull, there is a hole in the skull called the foramen magnum that allows the spinal cord to pass through and communicate with the rest of the central nervous system. As you can see, these diagrams are packed with all sorts of information, so if it is the first time you see all these words, make sure to go slowly through them to avoid any confusion. I hope that this final view of what we discussed will help summarize the key components of the external anatomy of the spinal cord. Alright, with this general anatomy of the external surface of the spinal cord now taken care of, let's take a closer look at the spinal cord without any vertebrae to see how spinal nerves go in and out of the structure. This will allow us to establish some important terminology before we discuss the internal anatomy of the spinal cord. Again, we have our spinal cord in the middle, and now you can see more clearly what the spinal nerves look like. In this diagram, we can see two pairs of spinal nerves, and as a reminder, the spinal cord had three important functions, namely, being the sensory motor intermediate between the body and the brain, having the sensory motor reflex circuitry, and the central pattern generators that produce rhythmic movements. Before we dive into some of the terminology, I want to quickly review the neuroanatomical navigation terms because a lot of the terminology that we will see is based on their logic. So, for the spinal cord, the direction towards the brain is rostral, and the direction away is caudal. On the other axis, towards the back is dorsal, and towards the belly is ventral. Additionally, if we consider this axis of front to back for the body, the dorsal side is also known as posterior, and the ventral side is also known as interior. The important axis that we will consider for our purposes here is this one, the dorsal to ventral or posterior to anterior axis. In the diagram that we have right now, this side of the spinal cord that is closest is on the ventral or anterior side, so near the belly, and it goes towards the dorsal or posterior side. Because of that, if we divide in the middle like this, everything near us will be suffixed by ventral and away by dorsal. Generally speaking, any sort of cross-section of the spinal cord will generally be oriented like this, with the ventral side closest to you and the dorsal side being the furthest. Now, keeping that in mind, let's now consider the spinal nerves in more detail. 
As I have said many times, spinal nerves carry both afferent sensory information towards the spinal cord and efferent motor information away from the spinal cord. Starting with afferent sensory information, when it travels towards the spinal cord, it reaches a structure called the dorsal root ganglion, which is an enlarged structure that contains the cell bodies, or cell somas, of the pseudo-unipolar sensory neurons, here shown in blue by the field circle. After crossing the dorsal root ganglion, the structure branches into what are called dorsal rootlets, here highlighted in yellow, and these rootlets end up conducting the afferents into the spinal cord. When we consider efferent motor information, the cell bodies of the motor neurons originate in the spinal cord and leave by ventral rootlets to reach a structure known as the ventral root before joining sensory afferents in the spinal nerve. Because the spinal nerve ends up carrying both afferent and efferent information, it is also referred to as a mixed nerve. In this figure, you might have noticed that the spinal nerve splits in two. The dorsal portion is called the dorsal ramus, and the ventral portion is called the ventral ramus. Although both rami are spinal nerves and carry sensory motor information, the main difference between the two is that the dorsal ramus carries this information to supply the posterior trunk and the posterior head, and the ventral ramus carries this information to supply the limbs and the interior portion of the trunk. One important element that I hope you have noticed is that sensory information is segregated from motor information as it goes dorsally and motor information leaves ventrally. This will be really important to keep in mind when we will cover the internal anatomy of the spinal cord. Now, what I just told you and what you see in this diagram is only part of the story when it comes to the spinal nerves. Indeed, the structures that you see here only hold for the functioning of the somatic nervous system. Remember that along with the somatic nervous system that controls voluntary functions, the peripheral nervous system is also made out of the autonomic nervous system that controls involuntary functions also with the aid of spinal nerves. However, the autonomic nervous system is much more complex with respect to the spinal cord because there are two different branches, namely the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, and they both use different mechanisms to reach their targets. As a result, there is much more diversity and exceptions to consider when discussing how the autonomic nervous system uses spinal nerves. So, although I plan on covering the principles of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system in other videos, let me show you a few structures and discuss some key concepts that should be helpful to get an intuition. First, it is important to establish that the main difference between the somatic and autonomic nervous system when it comes to the spinal cord has to do with the processing of the efferent motor command. Indeed, when we consider a cross-section of the spinal cord, motor neurons from the somatic nervous system will leave through the ventral root and go on to directly synapse with striated muscle fibers for voluntary control. On the other hand, the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches use intermediate ganglions before reaching their targets such as the heart. As we defined previously, remember that a ganglion is a term used to describe a collection of cell bodies. As such, if we first consider the sympathetic nervous system, the efferent commands that will leave the spinal cord will leave by the ventral root and contact a ganglion where they will synapse on another neuron that will then reach the target. Because of this ganglion intermediate, the first neuron is usually referred to as a preganglionic neuron and the second as a postganglionic neuron. When it comes to the parasympathetic nervous system, it somewhat has the same logic with the ganglion but the preganglionic neuron originates from a different part of the body, for example, the brainstem. Now, this is a very simplified view and a broad generalization of what happens with the autonomic nervous system, as there is much more to consider in terms of the targets, the neurotransmitter released, what activates the preganglionic fibers, and so on. For our purposes, the main difference when it comes to spinal cord anatomy that we will consider is the location of the ganglion, because as you can see here, the ganglions for the sympathetic nervous system are very close to the spinal cord, whereas they are further away for the parasympathetic nervous system. Back to the schematic, let's take a look at how the ganglions are structured for the sympathetic nervous system. So, it turns out that the sympathetic ganglions are organized in this structure called the sympathetic chain ganglia, or sometimes called the paravertebral ganglia. As you can notice from the name and the figure, this structure is essentially multiple ganglions connected to one another. 
The length of the structure extends from segments T1 to L3, so it essentially covers most of the distance of the vertebral column. As we mentioned previously, these ganglions contain the cell bodies of postganglionic neurons that go on to reach their respective targets. To communicate with the chain of ganglia, the efferent preganglionic neurons enter the chain through a small pathway called the white communicating ramus to synapse on postganglionic neurons that then leave the chain ganglia to reach the spinal nerve through the gray communicating ramus. The reason why one of these pathways is called gray and the other white is because the gray communicating ramus is unmyelinated and thus appears darker in imaging studies when compared to the white communicating ramus. Now, because of the chain-like structure of these ganglions, the preganglionic fibers have the possibility to move up and down this sympathetic trunk to synapse at postganglionic neurons that are responsible for different segments. Moreover, preganglionic fibers also have the capacity to continue their journey through nerves called splanchnic nerves and reach more distant ganglions called prevertebral or collateral ganglions. Now, keep in mind that this structure is simply for the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system uses different pathways to reach its targets. Indeed, apart from the preganglionic fibers that arise from the brainstem, the segments S2 to S4 in the spinal cord have preganglionic fibers that leave the ventral root and by way of the pelvic splanchnic nerve, they reach their postganglionic target. In summary, the nerves of the somatic nervous system compare like this to the nerves of the autonomic nervous system. The two models share many similarities and also differ on a few aspects, but nonetheless, this gives us a good overview of how the closed structures outside the spinal cord are organized. Again, these diagrams are very packed with information, so make sure to go slowly if it is the first time you see these words. Alright, with these structures now clarified, let's now consider the internal anatomy of the spinal cord. To do so, let's take a look at a cross-section from the cervical, thoracic, lumbar and sacral divisions of the spinal cord. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.